So uh, can you see my uh, slide? Yes, we can. Yes, great. Uh, so uh, hello, everyone, again. My name is Jonathan. Uh, as uh, Kobe said, I'm the director of uh, threat research at uh, JFOX Security. So we already started mentioning a little bit on supply chain attacks uh, risk, but I would like in this presentation to um, um, to actually explain uh, why malicious packages become such a popular attack method in supply chain attacks in the last couple of years. So we will take a look on supply chain attacks from the attacker's point of view and, and explain on, uh, on a technical level how to uh, identify and prevent an infection by a malicious package. And often we will take a look on real code examples of malicious packages when the, um, the majority of the examples will be uh, from real malicious packages that were found by JFOG security researchers and uh, were publicly uh, disclosed. Um, so uh, Kobe already uh, introduced me. Uh, so uh, nowadays I'm leading the threat research team in JFOG security. Uh, we do all some kind of uh, researches in vulnerabilities analysis, threat intelligence, and automated threat detection. Um, and as for the agenda, we will first introduce the security threat in, inherent in a supply chain and learn the key role that malicious uh, packages play in it. Uh, then we will dive into the technical details of malicious packages infection methods, uh, common payloads used in malicious packages, and, and how attackers uh, hide malicious code in them. Uh, finally, we will present techniques uh, to detect and prevent malicious packages, both known and unknown. Uh, and uh, we show the best practices for secure code development to avoid uh, the risk of uh, malicious packages. So when we talk about malicious packages, uh, security threat, we first need to understand the bigger problem that malicious uh, packages are a part of. Uh, this is the software supply chain attacks. Um, in uh, modern software uh, development, many applications integrate uh, third-party software and especially open source software in their code and, and trust the third party to supply a secure and stable software. And in general, this is, this is a good practice because we don't want to reinvent the wheel every time we, we write code. Um, but in reality, unfortunately, there is, this practice also involves some danger, of course, because third-party software might contain vulnerabilities uh, or uh, malicious code that, that will be um, uh, delivered through the supply chain uh, of third-party software together with the software itself. So, so these vulnerabilities and malicious code will eventually affect the end product that, that depends on them. And so there are no, you can already understand that there, there is no single target that are being involved in this attack because when you attack a supply chain um, by infecting a software package in the supply chain, for example, you will eventually end up with attacking all of the end consumers of, uh, of this uh, supply chain. So you can understand already the, the first reason of why an attacker would go for the software supply chain approach. Uh, that's because of the, the high distribution of the attack, as we said. Uh, let's talk now on, on the effort that an attacker needs to invest in supply chain attacks. Uh, um, you know, compared to classic targeted attack, attacks that we've seen in the, a lot in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, yeah, and it, it will help you to understand why this attack method became so popular recently. So in a classic attack method, the attacker had to invest a lot of time and money for compromising a single target. And it becomes even harder when the target is known software platform because those platforms are highly maintained and secured uh, compared to uh, relatively small open source software packages that are out there. Uh, so for targeted attack, an attacker would need to, uh, we need to have high technical skills because essentially it involves finding a vulnerability and developing a working exploit for it. So, so take a look on the pricing table here on the right, uh, taken from uh, Zerodium, which is a soft, which is a exploit acquisition platform. You can see that a remote code execution exploit can cost up to $1 million for a single exploit when, when the most expensive one is, is a zero day uh, RCE click, uh, uh, zero, zero uh, uh, click RCE uh, exploit for uh, Windows. So, so when attacking um, malicious open source uh, software in the other side, the, the options are, are endless and you don't have to invest a lot of uh, effort to, to exploit them because there are many packages out there. So the attackers simply have to find a single package to attack or to publish a single uh, malicious software package. And it's a game over for the entire consumers of the, of the supply chain of this package. 
so as we said, eventually th this abuses the, the trust that exists between parties in the supply chain, making this attack methods so effective. Um, so there are three different types of software supply chain threats. So two of them are based on software vulnerabilities, whether an intentional or unintentional ones. Uh, and uh, those vulnerabilities usually refer to a software bug, which uh, each bug is normally assigned with a CV identifier. Uh, CV is, is common standard to describe vulnerabilities and, and exposure, and they are widely used to document and track vulnerabilities uh, in software. Um, the third type of software supply chain uh, threat, and this is the one that we're going to focus on today, is the malicious component or the um, uh, malicious software package. Uh, and usually CV is not assigned to this type of threat. Uh, and the entire package or specific version of the package are simply tagged as, as malicious. Um, let's see a few real life examples for it. So for the unintentional bug, we have of course uh, the infamous uh, Spring Shell vulnerability that uh, was found this year in the popular Java framework uh, called Spring. Um, the Spring framework package is highly used by Java projects. So the, the, you know, the, the global effect of this vulnerability uh, was very high. Um, and for the intentional bug, uh, we can see uh, the famous SolarWinds attack when, when SolarWinds uh, Orion software uh, was uh, attacked and, and a backdoor was injected to it actually. Um, thousands of consumers of this uh, software uh, was affected by the attack leading to even more follow-ups attacks that were carried out later. Uh, so this is, was, was a, a very a huge and famous attack uh, for, the, for intentional vulnerability. Um, and in this presentation, of course, we are going to focus on malicious uh, component threats. And, and here we can see an example from one of our publications on malicious uh, NPM, package, uh, NPM packages that we found and, uh, and uh, disclosed. So after introducing the software supply chain attacks and how malicious packages uh, play a key role in it, uh, let's dive into the technical deals. So first we'll start with the, um, um, with the with infection methods, sorry. Uh, so start with infection methods, uh, then we go to uh, uh, payloads used by, uh, by attackers. Um, and uh, we will uh, go into some technical details about them and we'll show our findings on those. Uh, so let's start with, with infection methods. So how attackers uh, cause malicious packages to get installed in practice. We'll talk on uh, type of squatting, attack method, masquerading, uh, Trojan package, dependency confusion, or name squatting. And of course, uh, um, um, packages hijacking, which, uh, which we saw a lot in the news recently, actually. Um, the first infection method called uh, typo squatting. So typo squatting is the practice of uh, obtaining or, or squatting a popular name with a slight typographical error. Uh, this practice uh, applies to many different resources such as web pages, executable names, and also software packages names in, in our case that we're, that, uh, we're going to talk right now. Um, so let's take one class, classic example that probably everyone knows, uh, uh, buying the domain name uh, google.com instead of the legitimate uh, google.com, uh, hoping that uh, users will uh, uh, occasionally make uh, typing errors and reach the Ill illegitimate domain. This can uh, be further uh, be used for any kind of attack payload, such as phishing and uh, code injection attacks. So, so actually in a trend that we're seeing recently, some maintainers and developers take an active role and actively reserve type of squatting uh, names for the projects to, to prevent attackers from taking control of them. So regarding to our example with Google, uh, Google actually uh, registered this domain specifically, the domain google.com. And if you browse to google.com, you will be uh, referred to google.com. Um, here you can see an example of a malicious package that uh, used the type of squatting infection method. Uh, this package was uh, detected in a recent uh, research uh, that uh, we conducted uh, in uh, JFox security. So this malicious package name uh, is, uh, is mplotlib. Um, you can see, uh, sorry, is, is, uh, is mplotlab. And actually the user tried here to install mplotlib. Uh, he simply made a uh, typo error. Uh, you can see that uh, even though he made this typo error, the package uh, simply uh, uh, installed and, uh, and it was actually the malicious package that, that was installed on his machine. Um, you can see uh, that uh, we have the console here and the package was successfully installed. Um, uh, Besides type of squatting, there is an interesting thread of another infection method in which malware authors completely duplicate a well-known uh, package. 
Um, the, the authors or the attackers duplicate uh, um, uh, both the code and the metadata of, uh, of the original project, which will, they would like to impersonate. And then also add some small piece of uh, malicious code to this, uh, to this duplicate, essentially um, building a Trojan package. Uh, this infection method is similar to the type of squatting infection method in a, in a way that the attackers use a name similar to the legitimate package name. But the difference is that they aim to deceive developers through a similarity to the legitimate uh, package rather than aiming for accidental use uh, uh, because of typos. Uh, this is an example of the malicious package uh, uh, MarkJS, uh, which was found uh, in one of our uh, researchers. Um, this malicious uh, package actually masquerades a very uh, known package called Mark. So you can see the name MarkJS here. So um, maybe maybe you can see it already right now, but there is something very strange about this uh, this uh, package. Again, it's a very popular package. So you can see that the weekly downloads here are very, very low. And, uh, and this package is, is very known and popular. So it, it looks a little bit weird. So let's take a look on the, on the, on the comparison of uh, both packages. So you can see that the, the, um, the malicious packages on the top and the legitimate packages on the bottom, of course, we can see the, the download rates of them. And, uh, and uh, you can see also that the original name and metadata of uh, MarkJS malicious package were copied from the original uh, uh, Marked package, uh, making it very hard to distinguish between the two. So the URL of the repo is, is the same as well as the homepage and, and the description. So that makes it so hard for, uh, uh, for developers to, uh, you know, to, to find the, the right package, the one that they want to install. So when comparing the malicious package uh, MarkJS code with the original package marked, uh, we can see that uh, the only difference from the original package is one line in a single file. And this is the, the long uh, black, uh, the one that is marked in black here. Uh, you can see that this line does not contain any readable code and it relies between other le legitimate and readable lines. So this is actually the obfuscated malicious code, which is uh, the only addition to the original uh, legitimate package, making this modified package to be fully functional, but also, of course, uh, malicious. So it is important to know that because of this line is buried inside the rest of the package, which contains, as we said, a lot of legitimate code, uh, it will be very difficult for, uh, for a human being to find uh, this, uh, uh, this line, this illegitimate line, this malicious code without automated uh, scanning or, uh, or diffing tools. Another infection method is, is the Trojan package. In this infection method, the attacker uh, publishes a, a fully functional uh, library, but also hides a malicious uh, uh, code in it. The, the same as, the, as in the masquerading method, the malicious code is usually small or obfuscated. Therefore, it is hard to detect and differentiate between it and the legitimate functionality of the package. So this is actually uh, a publishing a, a real package, but uh, uh, putting some malicious code in it. So in this screenshot, uh, you can see an example of a readme file of a very interesting Trojan package called uh, Lemma, uh, which is a package that we found uh, in one of our uh, researches. Uh, this uh, malicious uh, Trojan package was caught uh, by, by our uh, scanners, and then we, we uh, uh, researched that uh, further, and uh, we found that this package is a utility for, for uh, uh, hacking Discord accounts, for stealing Discord accounts token, uh, intended for use by malware authors uh, to hack Discord accounts. So this package actually is malicious, but the funny thing is that inside this package, there is a code that steal the... the um, uh, the tokens uh, that were stolen by attackers, uh, and it steals that from the attackers. So if you use this library to steal uh, Discord tokens, it will steal the Discord tokens from you if you are an if you are an attacker or a, or a malicious uh, um, uh, person. Um, so let's go to the next infection method called dependency confusion, a very popular one that we've seen a lot in the in the last year specifically. It exploits a vulnerability in a way that many uh, package managers download dependencies uh, during uh, uh, a build process. Uh, so the vulnerability resides in the fact that most package managers such as uh, PIP and NPM do not distinguish between uh, internal packages hosted on you know, internal company servers and, and external one. 
Um, that's a, a simple command such as pip install my package would grab uh, the package either from the internal or the public server. So in the dependency confusion method, the attacker uses a specific package name of internal package of, of a target of, you know, like, like a very big company you want to compromise and uh, publish a malicious package on, intern, on an external, sorry, public uh, repository with this exact name. Usually the attacker also uh, assign a very high version number to uh, this uh, published package, making the internal servers uh, to, uh, uh, to think that there is a new version of this internal package on external uh, uh, servers. So, so in this scenario, most uh, default package managers configuration will prefer to download the external malicious package because of the high version number. Um, and we can see here in the screenshot, a nice example from, from a research that was published last year by a security researcher named uh, Alex uh, Birson. Uh, what we can see in, in this screenshot is, is a publicly available package in PyP, in PyPI, uh, which is the repository of, uh, of Python packages, the most uh, popular one, uh, with a name that looks like an internal package of Netflix. Uh, you can see it here, the NTFLX here. Uh, with a very high version uh, number. So, so with this attack, actually, uh, 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 Birson managed to successfully exploit Netflix uh, servers as well as also other big companies such as Apple, Microsoft, by, by making, simply by making their servers to download the malicious external package instead of the legitimate internal one. Um, we go to the last uh, uh, infection method, which is package, package hijacking. Uh, again, something that we see a lot recently. Uh, this method involves taking over a legitimate known package and pushing malicious code into it. Uh, well, well, this is not an easy task. It is very effective because it can take advantage of the popularity of very known uh, uh, packages for, for a high infection rate. Uh, so the hijacking usually performed by hacking maintainers and developers account or by injecting uh, hidden or obfuscated malicious code as part of a seemingly legitimate code contribution uh, to an open source project, but actually uh, a malicious code uh, in it. Uh, several months ago, um, it was detected that a few notable legitimate uh, packages were attacked and hijacked by taking over the maintainer's account and pushing uh, malicious code uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to their uh, repositories. And, and here we give one example, which is UA parser JS, a very popular one. Um, and uh, we can see uh, uh, here that uh, uh, we can see that there is an announcement by the developer of this package saying that he believes someone hijacked his package and uh, published a malicious version of it. Th this incident specifically actually made GitHub uh, to enforce two-factor authentication uh, for uh, maintainers and, uh, and uh, admins of uh, popular uh, NPM packages. Uh, so uh, this is, was a, a very famous uh, uh, case. And there are also, okay, there are also uh, cases when developers hijack their own project and intentionally sabotage them. And, and uh, we have two very interesting cases here. Um, so so understand that you know, package hijacking is not only something by, by third party, but also the first party, the maintainer can do it. Uh, so first is, is the publicized uh, incident of uh, two NPM packages, Faker and Colors when their maintainer intentionally sabotaged these popular packages, adding an infinite loop to their code, which bricked thousands of projects that depends on them just, just for the purpose of uh, uh, protesting against uh, something like corporations that use open source, but do not give back to the community. So that was the story in this case. Uh, and in another more recent incident that happened actually uh, three months, months ago, uh, a developer added uh, a code to his package, to the to node IPC uh, package that corrupts uh, the file system of Russian and Belarusian uh, uh, machine. And that was uh, to protest against the uh, 2022 Russian uh, invasion of uh, Ukraine. Uh, when the executed malicious code detected that the machine has an IP address located in Russia or Belarus, the code started to override arbitrary files in the, in the machine file system. So, that was a very famous case uh, three months ago. Um, still talking on hijacking method, what about hijacking a, a software package by registering uh, an expired domain? And this is something that uh, is a little bit uh, related to uh, what uh, Han uh, talked about uh, earlier. Um, uh, so, so here we talk about registering the expired domain name of the maintainer's uh, email address. So if uh, 
uh, we have uh, some expired domain name, of course, uh, the attacker can simply exploit that uh, to, um, uh, to register this domain and, and uh, initiate a password recovery in NPM. Uh, and then uh, when you open uh, an email address in this domain and maintain an email address, for example, here you can see that we gave uh, uh, email address in, in, the, in the NPM package configuration, uh, the, he will able simply to recover the password and, and take over the, the package. So this case is, is interesting because we saw some cases that there are uh, some forgotten uh, user and emails in, in the maintainer list. So if there is a, a one that is new and the other one is a little bit old and the maintainers forgot about it. So this one actually uh, can be used for exploitation uh, by attackers. Uh, we actually uh, published a, a thorough analysis on this attack method on, on the NPM ecosystem last month. Uh, and we found more than 3000 vulnerable packages with, with expired maintainers email domain names. Uh, this is the, the last trend in malicious packages and infection method, and we see rise in uh, those attacks in the, in the past month. So, so expect to see more uh, of this uh, in, the, in the near future. Okay, so, so now that we presented the, the infection methods that are used by malicious packages, we can continue to the last uh, phase, which is the, the payload phase, what, what attackers want to do after a successful uh, uh, exploitation. So we will present some very common payloads that are ex executed in malicious packages. Those are pretty much similar to, uh, to malwares that, that, uh, like uh, uh, other malwares that, that you see uh, out there, uh, more classic one, not, not in source code, for example. Um, but, but there are some differences and we will talk about it and mention uh, uh, a few of those. Uh, we will uh, take a look on sensitive data steers, uh, connect back shell, download and execute, and of course, a very popular uh, payload of executing a crypto miner on the victim machine. Um, so you can see here the first one, uh, the first payload, which is a sensitive data stealer. This is simply uh, uh, for for uh, stealing uh, um, a credit card or password or any sensitive data from, from the user uh, uh, browser. So you can see here that uh, this exploits uh, the, the, the autofill or the password they save and credentials and, uh, and um, um, credit cards uh, uh, storing of uh, web browsers and the attackers try to, to, uh, to steal that. You can see here a uh, code, small code snippet from, from a noblest malicious package that we found. Uh, we tried to connect uh, to, uh, to Chrome database and uh, get all the credit card information from it. And also uh, the, same, the same example in, in, in uh, Edge browser actually. Uh, and the attacker here tries to uh, get the, the credentials uh, that are saved in Edge. Uh, of course, uh, another thing that is uh, interesting uh, and we see a lot is, is stealing environment variables. Uh, this is something that is more related to production environments because most of the time in environment variables, we can see some sensitive data, some uh, uh, credentials. For example, here we can see AWS uh, credentials, secret access keys are kept in, in environment variables. So this is a very interesting uh, target for attackers to take over. Um, let's see, let's take a look at another uh, payload example, the ConnectBook shell. This is a pretty much normal uh, uh, ConnectBook uh, uh, shell, like a reverse shell. So we have first here to uh, uh, receive the commands to execute, send back the execution result to the server. Here in the code snippet, you can see from actual uh, malicious package that we found called HPID, um, that uh, there is a, uh, an execution of the received shell command string uh, here. And then the, the results from the execution are encrypted and sent to, uh, to the attacker uh, uh, machine. Um, okay, let's take a look on, on another. Uh, this is the, the last uh, payload that we'll talk about, uh, which is a crypto uh, miner payload. This payload utilizes uh, the victim system resources for, for the mining of uh, cryptocurrency. So as you remember, most of the time, malicious packages are not used in targeted attack, but rather by spreading them to as many as victims as possible uh, with, the, with all of the infection methods that we mentioned earlier. So utilizing uh, many system resources from many victims is, is a good idea for a profitable uh, payload in malicious packages. Um, and this one, crypto miner is, is, a, is a very good one. Uh, you can see here that uh, there is uh, in the in the payload uh, itself. This is from the uh, install script from the malicious package. 
we can see that the, uh, the malicious package download the best script and then inside the best script, we can see it here. There is also uh, uh, downloading and executing a, a crypto miner called Phonix miner, which is actually uh, crypt, uh, um, uh, cryptocurrency, uh, sorry, mines a cryptocurrency called Ubik. Um, so here we can see the execution. Uh, so this is very popular uh, payload uh, in malicious packages. Okay, so after we talk about the infection methods and the payloads that are used, let's talk now about, you know, defending against it, detecting malicious packages, how we can, as developers or security uh, um, uh, researchers can detect and, and avoid uh, malicious packages. Um, so, so the general idea, let's, let's take with detecting known malicious packages. We will, we will also talk about unknown, but let's start with detecting known malicious packages. Those are ones that are already um, uh, disclosed and there is public information on them. So what we want to do is essentially uh, the thing that we do most of the time when we, uh, 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 the same process that we do uh, for, um, uh, for, for detecting vulnerabilities. So first of all, is scanning the project dependencies, uh, detecting the installed software and versions based on it and creating software bill of material. Um, then fetching security information from public repositories and ask them if I have, you know, malicious package X in version Y, is it uh, malicious? But the problem is that many repositories uh, don't save historical data actually. And uh, we, here we give example on uh, PyP and NPM. On PyP malicious packages are, are, um, are being removed actually uh, from the repository when detected as malicious, uh, leaving no way to tell if uh, a package or a specific version of it was detected as uh, malicious sometime in the past. And in NPM, malicious packages are replaced with dummy code. You can see here uh, this, uh, this readme here, which uh, actually says that it's a security holding uh, package. But uh, the thing is that, that, that th this is good from, from one side, but for the other side, it's not useful to track specific malicious versions of uh, packages because they're simply being removed. Um, so um, uh, uh, this, this is what, another, another challenge. And if you want to know, if you want to rely on this data, even if you want, then, then uh, using some open source or some external um, uh, security auditing tools, uh, this is actually not, not, not enough because for example, NPM audit, which is the, uh, the tool for detecting NPM uh, vulnerabilities, uh, we can see here that we scanned uh, our project that contains this uh, malicious package called Colored Art, the ones that is here. Uh, and actually uh, found zero vulnerabilities. So, so this, is, this is a problem because this is a malicious package. And uh, the reason that it doesn't work because uh, NPM audit simply supports only vulnerabilities and not malicious packages detection. Um, so so what, what, is the, what is the solution? Um, um, the solution here is uh, simply to use a software composition analysis tool that have the, the ability to detect uh, uh, malicious uh, packages. So because all of the, the, these difficulties and because performing this process, we just described in scale as part of a software development lifecycle uh, in your project, uh, we need to automate the process by using a, a static composition analysis tool. Um, and and we, we need one that collects and store malicious packages names and, and actually have the, the ability to detect malicious packages. Um, so uh, here we uh, can show an example from uh, our uh, product, uh, JFrog X-Ray, and here we can see a detection of a known malicious uh, package. So let's quickly, we don't have a lot of time, uh, let's quickly jump to uh, detecting unknown malicious packages. So generally the, the idea here is to create some heuristics and scan uh, the popular repositories, the external repositories uh, uh, for uh, finding new unknown malicious packages. This is something that we do in JFrog Security. Um, every, every day, actually, we have an automation that, uh, that uh, try to scan and detect uh, this kind of activity. So actually, you can scan for any kind of activity. You can scan in any kind, any phase of the attack, the infection methods, the payload phase, and also some obfuscation techniques. So let's take one example. Uh, for example, in typo squatting, you can simply search for similarity between names. So if we have a very popular package, um, we, can, we can simply uh, try to find other names that uh, looks like uh, this package that are close and similar to this name and uh, alert on uh, new uh, published uh, packages that are uh, uh, similar to very popular one. In the payloads detector, let's take one, one example, download and execute, uh, for instance, so we can 
simply analyze source code of, uh, of, uh, of um, third party uh, libraries, of open source libraries uh, in NPM, in PyPI, or any external uh, repository, and actually find patterns of downloading and executing uh, binary. Um, so we can try to find, uh, you know, uh, some functions that uh, 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 downloading binaries and followed by uh, um, executing them. Um, so this is one example for payload detector. So we have we have a, a, this list. Of course, this is just you know for for uh, the general uh, idea of what what we do, what can be done. You can come with an, with other ideas. Uh, of course, if you are interested in hunting unknown malicious packages, this is the the, the approach that that we developed. Uh, best practices for secure development. Essentially, we want to uh, to defend against uh, uh, those kind of threats. So as we said, the most important thing is to use a software composition analysis tool, define policies based on that. So we want to, for example, break the build if we find a malicious package. Uh, and there are some other useful practices. You can read them uh, in, uh, in, uh, in our blog and actually uh, in, uh, in NPM. Those are for uh, um, um, building system to exclude remote repositories for internal packages for the dependency perfusion uh, attack. And we also want to mention just uh, one minute about the new project that JFrog announced uh, one month ago called uh, uh, Persia. Uh, this is a new open source initiative for creating a secure distributed peer-to-peer -peer packages repository for, provide, for providing integrity of software components. So this is what we want to do uh, to deal with, uh, with the software supply chain uh, problem. Uh, the project uses blockchain technology to establish a chain of uh, provenance uh, for open source components, so you can read more on that on uh, uh, on, on this website of uh, uh, Persia. We also would like to encourage the use of uh, open source tools that uh, can help you to deal with the malicious packages and prevent them from infecting your project. Some of them are ours, some of them are from third parties, but but all of them are very practical and helpful. We don't have time to go on each and every one of them, but uh, you can take that from uh, this uh, slide later. Uh, yes, that's all. Jonathan, yes. I'm sorry for interrupting. You need to wrap it up. So Yeah, uh, that's, that's the last uh, slide. So uh, uh, an opening for a uh, question. Great. So you have three uh, questions in the Q&A. If you can quickly answer them, it would be great. Great. Um, so with what source uh, the masquerading uh, enter in our uh, uh, packages? Uh, so I'm not sure what, what is the source here, but... Uh, you know, when when there is this kind of uh, uh, of attack, uh, it's actually um, 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 you know the, the, there is there is the the, the place when the the package is published and there is a malicious uh, uh, code into it. So so the source is actually a different package uh, that uh, that try to uh, you know look like another uh, a very popular package. And if it is installed by the developer, it's simply in in the developer machine. So I'm not sure if that uh, answer is the correct. Great. Um, what about different security controls that you uh, uh, implement on TPMs before incorporating them into your product? I'm not sure this is, uh, this is uh, uh, relevant for uh, my presentation. Uh, so maybe someone else will try to answer that. Are there any different controls between binary packages and source code that, that uh, you include? Yeah, I guess that you know, we, we simply uh, try in the, in the recent uh, year to, to uh, 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 shift left, like going to the developer machine and scan those uh, threats in the source code, in the IDE of the developer. So not just by uh, uh, scanning the binaries, which is what, what JFrog uh, 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 does the best, uh, we can also, uh, you know, scan in very early stage of development in the, in the developer machine for those kind of activities. That's all right. <laughs> uh, yes, thanks a lot, uh, Jonathan. It was very enrichful.